In this episode, I want to talk about Jesus as a group thought form, or what they know in occult circles as an egregore. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about a group thought form? Well, let's begin with just thought forms in general. Now, the idea of group thought forms and egregores, uh, egregore is a term that goes back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. It uh, the, the concept of the egregore or the concept of a thought form or a group thought form is rooted in antiquity, and it's also rooted in the East. They know about this in Hinduism. They know about this in Buddhism, in monasteries and temples around the world. The term for an egregore in the Eastern uh, hemisphere would be a tulpa, at least in Buddhist tradition. So what is a tulpa or what is an egregore? What is a thought form? <clears throat> well, it begins with the idea that thoughts, because we are living beings and we're generating energy, that our thoughts become living energies. So for example, a person can have their own individual thought form. Uh, this happens often during trauma. When a person has experienced trauma, particularly repeated trauma, maybe in childhood, they will feel the same feelings of anxiety. They may have some of the same thoughts that are repetitive. Uh, you're worthless. You're never going to measure up. You're never going to amount to anything and so on. And what people will often find <clears throat> is that those thoughts and emotions kind of take on a life of their own. And in a sense, they really do. So the person, even though they know, maybe they've gone through to therapy, maybe they have other reasons to believe in their experience that they do have value or they should be happy, but they feel they still feel depressed. They're still bringing with them and bringing forward a lot of those childhood experiences. Clinical definition would say that the brain uh, has just created neural pathways and that those neural pathways just keep operating. But from an ancient perspective or an occult perspective, the approach might be more to get the person delivered or set free from this living thought form that they have created. Now, as I said, the idea of an egregore is a group thought form. So what happens, let's suppose this is true. Let's suppose that we have the ability to create thought forms and these thought forms become entities. They become basically living beings of their own. This was the idea of the egregore in the ancient world. And again, the idea of the tulpa in Buddhist tradition. So what happens with the group thought form? What happens when a bunch of people come together and they start thinking the same thoughts? Uh, and energizing those thoughts with emotion and devotion and do this over and over and over again over a long period of time. See, an individual thought form isn't going to really take on manifestation as its own entity unless there's a lot of emotional energy that goes with it, and it happens over a repeated period of time, meaning this person, uh, let's say, gives out fear over and over and over again then what can happen is that fear can create a non-physical entity. I was listening to a teacher on the paranormal recently, and he said after 30 years of dealing with haunted houses and poltergeists and uh, entities that afflict people, he made the statement that in his experience in 30 years of doing this kind of work, that 90% or 95% of what people experience is actually a thought form that's created off their own trauma or high emotional experience. So in this case, what this teacher is saying, this teacher of the paranormal, is he's saying that a lot of these non-physical entities that we call poltergeists are not earthbound spirits or wandering spirits. They're spirits that were created by the people who lived in the house. <laughs> but they can take on such a life of their own as a non-physical entity that they can move objects, they can slam doors, they can flush toilets, things of this nature. And he said 95 or 96% of what he deals with, he considers to be thought forms. Now, what happens when you get a group of people together around the world who are generating even more, say in the case of the Catholic Church. The Catholic egregore, Jesus then, has been around for thousands of years and has been uh, followed and invested in by thousands of devout people around the world. So let's talk about Jesus, the egregore. Have you ever noticed that 
every church, every denomination seems to have their own version of Jesus. Uh, you can see it very clearly if you know anything about religion in America. If you were to go to a traditional Southern Baptist church, you would learn about a certain Jesus or version of Jesus that was very interested in your sexual purity, very interested in family values, and interested in saving you and your neighbors through praying the sinner's prayer and being baptized and joining the church. The one thing that the Southern Baptist Jesus does not do is uh, empower you with the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. The one thing that the Jesus of the Southern Baptist movement does not do is miracles or healings. And so people that generally covenant with that spirit or covenant with that egregore or covenant with that thought form version of Jesus, they don't see a lot of results in the area of answered prayer and miracles and healings, those kinds of things. Now, if you come over to a Pentecostal church, particularly the Pentecostal holiness, the Assembly of God movement, or um, any of the other sort of charismatic or Pentecostal offshoots, but particularly the Pentecostal holiness, now you have a Jesus who will occasionally at least do miracles and healings and have people uh, being what we used to call slain in the spirit, where they get prayed for and fall down. I'm sure maybe you've seen that on TV. Or uh, uh, this Jesus would operate in a certain way and really have a completely different personality than the Southern Baptist Jesus. And then if you're familiar at all with the prosperity gospel, you have a prosperity Jesus. Now, this goes totally contrary to the Catholic Jesus, because the Catholic Jesus was poor, and in fact, priests today still take a vow of poverty. And so now you have a version of Jesus who is really not interested so much in you selling all you have and giving it away to the poor. This Jesus, like every successful uh, American <laughs> distortion or version of things. This Jesus is interested in making you wealthy. This Jesus is interested in making you rich, might be interested in healing you, might be interested in helping you to experience abundant life and, and those kinds of things. And so you can see that that Jesus has a personality of its own. And then you can come to uh, maybe the Bethel movement the Bethel Jesus is very interested. He's much more casual Jesus, but he's very interested in making you laugh. He's very interested in intimacy and touching your life. He's very interested in healings and signs and wonders and miracles. So that's the Bethel Jesus that you get. And then you can break it down even smaller to local congregations. So you can look at the movements and the egregore, the thought form that's held by people that are part of larger movements. But then even churches that are within those movements, uh, people begin to develop a, a relationship with a version of Jesus that belongs to the, to the house, so to speak, as we would say. So what begins to happen, again, is as we give our thoughts, as we give our devotion, as we give our emotions, as we give our worship to uh, collectively as a group, there forms a collective group, non-physical entity that takes on, spins off, and takes on a life of its own. It becomes a real entity, just like the man that was teaching about the paranormal and the poltergeist. These Christ figures or these Jesuses that exist around the world also become living entities that then can communicate with the members through intuition or through visions or through the mind, uh, through the emotions, whatever the case may be. But one thing that's important to understand, maybe the most important thing to understand about a thought form, an egregore, whether you're dealing with a personal thought form or you're dealing with one on a more corporate level, or you're trying to leave religion, <laughs> you're trying to get out, you've deconstructed, but there's something still in the back of your mind. There's something still holding you or pulling onto you or people from the church, you go through a bad day and someone in church calls up and says, I know you had a bad day today. The Lord showed me. And you think, oh my God, the omnipotent God showed you. No, you guys are all in relationship with a thought form that has access to your thoughts and feeds off your thoughts. See, that's the most important thing to realize. These entities have no life in and of themselves. They have to feed. Just like our bodies have to feed off things of the earth, off of fruits and vegetables and animals and 
processed foods and whatever we can get. Uh, egregores feed off of thought energy. They feed off of emotion energy. So they will come and sort of poke you or they'll try to keep you in devotion. They will try to keep the flock together because the more people that they have, the more devotion, the more attention. Let's come to church on Sunday morning and let's come on Sunday night. Let's come on Wednesday night. Let's come for Bible study and let's just keep feeding these corporate thought forms, keep feeding these tulpas, keep feeding these egregores, and they get stronger. If the group gets smaller, or if someone stops feeding these egregores with the emotion of their choice or the devotion of their choice, then they begin to weaken and eventually they can go out of existence. So it's one of the things that I found interesting is I've gone through my own process of leaving religion and helped and counseled with hundreds of other people, including pastors and leaders who have left their uh, ministries or have deconstructed or struggled and wrestled through these processes. If they begin to challenge the group thought, if they begin to challenge the group doctrine, if they begin to ask questions that might undermine, that's when the, the fangs really come out with people, so to speak. Now, what I mean by that is you can mess up, you know, you can miss church, uh, be out of church for a long time, come back, they're going to receive you with open arms. In a lot of places, you can commit outright gross sin. Uh, and by sin, I just mean have horrible ethics. Uh, I know pastors that just have no ethics at all, that treat people terrible. Uh, but as members of congregations, you could end up doing something completely scandalous and unethical. Uh, but the moment you come back in, you're going to be received with love. You're going to be received with harmony. But don't challenge the agreements that we have about who Jesus Christ is. Don't challenge the agreements about what this God, this egregore, this version of Jesus requires of you. Because the moment you begin to break with the group thought form, the moment you begin to introduce disagreement, you need to understand that you are dealing with a non-physical entity that has now been threatened, its very survival has been threatened. I really want to get that point across to you. When you question in your church, when you leave over doctrinal statements, oftentimes the community will ostracize you. The community will excommunicate you. The community will reject you. Why, Aaron? Why do they ostracize us and reject us because we're asking questions or because we think differently, but yet they'll receive us with open arms if we commit some other kind of ethical violation or we're gone for a long time and then we come back. Well, it's simple. That thought form, that egregore is depending on the agreement of the group and the thinking of the group and the devotion of the group for its very survival. So for you to ask questions in a Bible study, for you to go to the pastors and the leaders and the elders and challenge their church doctrines is to threaten the survival of the group egregore that is both feeding the group and feeding off of the group, and always influencing the minds and emotions of the people in the group. So if you present good arguments or if you ask questions, the, there's potential that that could spread through the group. If you ask in Bible study, hey, uh, how come uh, Luke's account of Saul of Tarsus and his conversion is different in the beginning and in the end? And in some ways totally contradicts uh, Paul's own account in the book of Galatians. You start pointing out some of those things. Well, if you're part of a group where that Jesus um, has given you the Bible as the word of God, and that's your connection, and you're questioning the integrity of the Bible or the scriptures, or you're questioning the inerrancy of the scriptures, uh, well, if you do that in Bible study or home group, then someone else might say, you know, that's a good point. And they might th start thinking about it. And then groups within the group might start talking about it and thinking about it. And all of that stuff can ultimately uh, weaken the egregore and threaten its survival. So because there are links, there are mental links and mental cords, then the egregore will send thoughts and send emotions and send feelings into the leaders of the group. They'll become very protective. They will uh, badmouth you. They might even make up lies about you. They might even gossip about you because the survival of their egregore depends on what they're doing. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments. I can do a follow-up video on what to do when you've been subjected to an egregore, when you've made covenant with an egregore by joining covenant with the church 
or by going into a church setting and inviting that Jesus into your thought life and into your heart, or by uh, vowing submission, making a mental agreement of submission to that egregore, what you can do to get free from that. Until next time, I hope you're well, I hope you're blessed, and I hope everything's good for you.